Hello and welcome. Today you are joining me on the banks of the Ammon River as I greet you at the start of our weekly online worship service along with the folks of Craigsbank Parish Church here at the western end of Edinburgh. You join me as I'm sitting on the banks of the beautiful Almond River uh, near Cramond. Uh, over there uh, we have the ruins or what remains of the old uh, mill that used to operate on the banks of the river here. Today is a special day, uh, particularly if, if you're a father, as it's Father's Day. Some of the mothers and some of the children might, go, might be going, oh, my word, forgot that. Now you've been reminded. Our service today on a day uh, like this would typically be focusing on, on fathers or maybe on God the Father. Today I will be concentrating a little bit on a role that God assigned to us as humankind. A role that would typically have been uh, fulfilled by fathers or more often than not by men. It's the role of the farmer, or more particularly, the gardener of a royal estate. Our reading today has a look at Genesis chapter 2, which is another creation story. But it also focuses in specifically on rivers and water. Interestingly enough, Rain is also mentioned. And alongside that, the role of us as the keepers of God's garden. So I therefore greet you in the name of our Creator who created this beautiful uh, ecology that we are privileged to be a part of. I greet you with grace mercy and peace. Let us worship the Lord.
Today's reading is from Genesis 2, reading from verse 5 to 14, entitled The Garden of Eden. Listen for the word of the Lord. When the Lord God made the universe, there were no plants on the earth and no seeds had sprouted because he had not sent any rain and there was no one to cultivate the land. But water would come up from beneath the surface and water the ground. Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground and formed a man out of it. He breathed a life-giving breath into his nostrils and the man began to live. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man he had formed. He made all kinds of beautiful trees grow there and produce good fruit. In the middle of the garden stood the tree that gives life and the tree that gives knowledge of what is good and what is bad. A stream flowed in Eden and watered the garden. Beyond Eden it divided into four rivers. The first river is the Phison. It flows around the country of Havilah. Pure gold is found there and also rare perfume and precious stones. The second river is the Gion. It flows round the country of Cush. The third river is the Tigris and flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. God bless this reading from his holy word. Amen. Right, way to begin. I have so much to uh, share with you from this wonderful piece of literature, this ancient divinely inspired text, but I only have 10 minutes uh, to do it in. That's generally what we are told to keep these online sermons to by our peers. Uh, short attention span, boredom and all of that, you know. Um, if it's too much uh, for you for one service, uh, then feel free to pause and then uh, you can listen at your own speed. You can adjust the speed actually. So here goes. Normally people think that Genesis 1 is um, the creation story and then in Genesis 2 we go into some more fine detail seeing uh, how God created man and then gave us this mission impossible like baking a beautiful cake and then putting it on the dining room table and telling the children you can't have any of it, it's just for looking at, no eating. Uh, obviously kids don't pass uh, the test and uh, we don't either and then all hell breaks loose in chapter 3 onwards. That's not true and also it's not true. Firstly Genesis 2 is not a follow on or a zooming in after the scene is set in Genesis 1 and secondly um, the task humankind is set is quite straightforward. It is not that impossible at all. Quite the opposite. You see in Genesis 1, um, Genesis 1 is one version of the creation story probably written by a priest with a focus on God as orderly and humans, uh, well, we are supposed to worship God per the required orderly fashion, step one, step two. That's not what Genesis 2 uh, story is about. Genesis 2 is not a refining of Genesis 1. Genesis 2 is rather an alternative take on God's creating this and that and everything else. Genesis 2 is likely written by somebody like a farmer or a manager even by a royal person, a person with an agricultural background or an agricultural focus who is concerned about the proper management of God's beautiful creation. Please do go and read the two versions on your own time, uh, keeping in mind that chapter 1 actually finishes at chapter 2, halfway through verse 4. The chapters and the verses as we know it today were only added midway through the 16th century. And uh, they weren't really part of the original text uh, which was written millennia before that. It's a long story. Contact me if you want more detail. The long and the short is Genesis 2 is likely written indeed with us as homo sapiens, as humankind in mind, but specifically with your and my role in creation in mind. Let's have a closer look. You'll see that there are three items that the author writes about and he or maybe she, but it's likely to have been a he in this case, um, writes that there are three things that we need to take um, notice of in this creation, this story of God's creation, before it then reaches a crescendo. 
So firstly, the plants. Secondly, the water. And thirdly, humans. Let's see that in color. The plants here, highlighted in green. The water, highlighted in blue. And the humans, highlighted here in yellow. Plants, water, and humankind. The story then unfolds in three stages. Stage one, we have a problem, Houston. Listeners, we have a problem. Ain't no plants. What are we going to eat? This is a desert type of crisis where uh, we are in big trouble. No food. And why are there no plants? Well, firstly, because there's no water. That's in the story. So how is life to be sustained without water? Because as we all know, water is life. Oh, but that's not the only problem. The problem is also that there's no one to take care of the plants, even uh, if there were plants. So, stage one, we have a problem with two causes. No plants to eat, because we ain't got no water, and we ain't got no one to look after the plants. It surely doesn't look good. So any farmer, any gardener in the ancient world, in the Middle East rather, or in the ancient Near East, would tell you, in that barren landscape, you need water. And you need someone to make the vineyard, to work the soil, to plant the trees, to get the water to the orchard, to prune the trees and the shrubs. And only then do you have a harvest to feed your family. So stage one, we have a problem. Stage two, good news. We have a good provider God who provides the solutions to solve the problem of no food and no beauty. Because remember, gardens don't only provide food, it also provides beauty. So stage two is God providing water. In this version, through springs that form rivers that provide the water that enables the life of the plants and its germination. God also, in stage two, provides the solution uh, to the entity that needs to look after the garden. Enter humankind, you and I. We are part of solving the food and beauty problem. So now that the author has our attention, focused on these three elements, plants, waters, and humans. We start off with stage three. This is when the author goes into more detail about the makeup of each of these three elements. Starting with humankind, uh, Homo sapiens, we with our clever thumbs, our ability to make tools, our larger frontal lobes, we who split the atom but who firstly broke the soil. Oh, and by the way, before you get too vainglorious about our existential self-importance, the ancient text reminds us that we are but clay figures. We are made of soil. If it wasn't for God's Spirit, we wouldn't have been here anything special. Furthermore, God then places us here. We didn't break into the garden having created it ourselves. We were created, not self-made. Secondly, we were privileged to be placed in the garden of Eden by the owner, the architect, to maintain the royal garden, the estate. Think of a royal estate. If you've been there, think of Alhambra in Spain. Think royal cherry tree garden in Japan. Think Serengeti in Africa. We are servants of the owner. These are not our subjects. We are merely stewards. Even if stewards of a glorious estate, we were given, handed the privilege. We did not earn it. We did not acquire it. So, moving on to the plants. Yes, great for food, but also aesthetically beautiful. Ask any landscape architect, ask any Munro bagger, ask Jim. Ask anyone confined maybe to their tenements for months during COVID. It isn't so much the nutrients of the food that they missed. They probably got that through their shopping. It is the wind 
in the willows, the scent of freshly fallen rain on grassy ba banks, or the shimmery, patchy shade you experience when you walk underneath the trees in a park. Nutrition, but also beauty for sustaining the soul. The plants are also here in this text. Um, it also has a, a deeper meaning with symbolism about knowledge as insight, but also knowledge as moral and ethical and spiritual um, insight, with elements of progress and regression captured in the symbol of the tree of life, knowledge, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This theme gets picked up later in uh, Revelation at the end of the Bible and in certain spaces in between. In Revelation we see um, the th theme of, of these trees being key to our understanding of God and faith and eternity. But I'm not going to focus on the trees today. Uh, we move on to the third element and that is that is the water or more specifically here uh, the rivers um, of, of which a lot is made in this uh, Genesis 2. It takes up the largest single part of the whole poem we are looking at. It reminds me of the glorious movie by uh, Robert Redford, A River Runs Through It, because a river does run through the Garden of Eden, giving it life and identity and dynamism. <clears throat> the author describes how this river is the source of life and wealth, of identity and diversity and of geopolitical power. I don't have the time to expound on it here, um, so contact me if you want a more detailed explanation, but just trust me, the river gives power, identity, life, direction, and so much, much more um, to the known world of those first years of that text. But also, we are here in Scotland, the original land of the free and the brave with its beautiful great sky but also very much with its abundance of water. The rivers Tay and Tweed, Spey and Dee, Forth and Clyde, with Lochs, beautiful beyond belief, Loch Lomond and Loch Ness, Loch Katrina and Loch Ranoch, Lochs Gary and Morlich, and so many more. That is not what the heroes of this ancient text would have known. The Near East and the Middle East in those days were at the opposite end of the water abundance scale. Think more heat, think less water. Think more desert and hot, rocky hills. Not that there was no water, just not so abundant, not so freely available, nor so readily accessible. More like what most of the world is staring in the face right now. Increasing water shortages. Ask the drought-stricken Cape Town or Mexico City. Ask the more than 1 billion citizens in India where more than 70% of water is unfit for human consumption. Mostly because of untreated waste inflow and industrial effluent. Or the slowly dying but once magnificent Mississippi River because of numerous oil spills. Have you tried fishing in the Thames lately? Or in the glorious Rhone River running through France where the PCB levels are 12 times what it should be in the fish. That's polychlorinated biphenyls. You might catch a fish but you do not want to eat it because you might actually catch something else in the process. Now why did I suddenly jump to the water and more specifically river pollution? Alan, we were just enjoying this idyllic picture of a water-rich arboreal garden with the luscious fruit and now this. The key is in, this, in the capstone verse of Genesis 2's creation poem. Have a look at verse 15. The very last line is the big crescendo of this wonderful piece. Let me read it slowly so that we don't miss it. The Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. 
we have God in the story, mankind, the garden, and here the key to unlocking and understanding this creation poem is, why did God create you and me and put us in the royal estate? To work it and to take care of it. In ancient Hebrew, um, it sounds like this. Le'ufda u shomra. All this creation, all this beauty, all this abundance, and then us. To do what? It could just as readily be translated, the Hebrew that is, to serve it and to take care of it. The first task we have is not don't eat of the forbidden fruit. The first task is not to love our neighbor. The first task is not even to worship God. These could all well be either obvious or implied. But the first task is straightforward, a mission quite possible. Serve the earth and take care of it. Whatever matters Whatever does religion or politics or relationships or wealth or justice or entertainment or industry, whatever else we as homo sapiens do, must, it must, according to the explicit will of God, be Le'ovda ul Shomra, to serve and to take care of creation. Part of which, by the way, is realizing how very, very important our water, our rivers, our streams are. As important as communion or the hymns are, as important as race relations and human rights are, as important as freedom of speech and church buildings are, even as important as the Bible or education are, these are all subsequent to our taking care of the natural world that we are part of. No water, no life. What does everything else then matter? No water, no food. What does the rest of it then matter if we have no water for no food and also no water, no beauty? What does everything else matter if there is no beauty? So on this day called Father's Day, are we willing to take care of and to serve our water resources as much as we are willing to care for our spouses and our children? Are we as providers and safeguarders of those we love, are we willing to safeguard the well-being of this planet's water? My time is up, but if you'd like to consider, reconsider the way you view rivers, then please have a look at this, uh, listen to this TED talk, which explains why we should honor rivers at least as much as we do our own rights. La Ovda Ul Shomra. Amen. Let us pray. Living God, loving God, hear our prayer. Creator God, how wonderful your handiwork is. From the beauty of the dawn breaking to the peace of sunset, your name is to be praised. Life-giving God, you made the waters to teem with life and the soil to spring forth life-sustaining plants. We praise you for the wonder that is this garden that you formed and shaped that we call planet Earth. We are aware that we have not kept it in the pristine state you entrusted it to us in. Please forgive us our poor stewardship and cleanse us of our selfishness, just as we cleanse our rivers of pollution. You have given us our daily water freely. Please help us to ensure that the thirsty amongst us will have their thirst quenched physically emotionally and spiritually. Lord Jesus, you promised the woman at the well that if we drink from your life-giving fountain, we will never thirst again. We will even have enough life to give to others. Here we are, Lord. Please quench our thirst for justice for all, for forgiveness of sins and for salvation, not only of our souls and our relationships, but also of our rivers and dams burns and streams, seas and oceans. Spirit of life, 
As you promised resurrection after death, you also promised the restoration of creation. Let your kingdom come and your will be done, here on earth as it is in paradise. Amen. So as we come to the end of our worship time together, uh, you might start making some plans for Sunday, if it's still Sunday, uh, when you watch this service online. Some of the dads might want to go out fishing. Uh, in our family, it's more likely to be my wife who does the fishing. Uh, I'd prefer to go canoeing or mountain biking. Uh, COVID regulations are allowing for it once it's time to do that. But how about it? Men and women, humankind, are you up for this privilege, this responsibility, this call to be gardeners and estate keepers in this estate that God entrusts to us called planet Earth? As we head off into our various uh, directions and lives the week ahead. I send you out with the reminder when Jesus said, and remember, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. 